This is a video about accounting. Thanks, kiddo. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this video that serves as an introduction to inventory. By the end of it, it's my hope that you will be able to define key terms related to inventory, including the term inventory itself, this concept of a stock out, and a couple of terms related to uh, the transportation of inventory. You will be able to identify what are called internal controls that are used to protect inventory. You'll be able to describe different types of inventory and explain when ownership or title of that inventory transfers from one company to another. And then last but not least, you will compare and contrast two inventory systems, one called periodic and the other perpetual. Now, each of us has had some sort of experience with inventory. Maybe you've gone into a store looking for a particular item and they've been out of it, or that has been what they say out of stock, which is called a stock out. Uh, maybe you've been in a store when an employee is stocking the shelves or the racks in the store. It's also possible that you've seen a commercial on television where a store is having a what's called a liquidation sale. And they say that everything must go. All of their inventory are being liquidated or turned into cash by being sold. The reality is that after cash on the balance sheet, inventory is the most important asset for both manufacturers and for retailers. Those are the companies that make stuff. If you're a manufacturer, you make stuff and you sell it. And if you're a retailer, you are primarily focused on selling inventory to the customers. Inventory is important for a few different reasons. The first is that it is the largest current asset that a company has that it's trying to convert to cash over the next reporting period. So first, it's a line item on the company's balance sheet, and they're trying to convert it to cash by selling it to customers. Because it's so important, because it's the largest current asset that a company has, uh, it must be managed effectively by the company. And there are a number of elements involved in managing inventory effectively. The first in the long chain is just ordering that inventory. And then eventually when the inventory a company has uh, is sold, they're going to have to reorder it. When those orders are placed, then the company is responsible for tracking their orders and for tracking their inventory. When it arrives, that inventory has to be stored so that it can ultimately be sold to the customers. And the last step that sort of oversees all of this is that the company has to assign a value to that inventory, and that is the subject of another video. The importance of inventory also means that investors and creditors need to understand how companies manage it and not just how but how well that they manage it if a company is mismanaging their inventory then they're at risk of losing customers because of stockouts or they're wasting money because they are over purchasing or storing inventory that isn't selling the last thing i'd like to point out is that storing inventory is a significant expense companies are constantly looking for ways to get that expense down they are trying a variety of strategies like carrying less inventory or renting smaller warehouses. Some companies are even exploring the idea of having stores that don't carry inventory for sale. They just have samples for customers to try on and then order for delivery, which is kind of like the car dealership model where you test drive a car, but that's not the car that you purchase. One is delivered. Since inventory is so important, and so valuable, and companies are trying to carry less of it to reduce the expense, they have to take steps to protect the inventory they have. And these are called internal controls. Depending on what it is, inventory can be stolen, it can be lost or misplaced, it could be damaged, or it can expire if it is food or medication. The official term used to describe stolen inventory is inventory shrinkage, which is a really nice way of saying stolen stuff. Companies develop these internal controls, which are systems and practices to preserve inventory and to avoid these types of losses. 
some examples of internal controls. I think the first one you'll be familiar with. Uh, security tags and alarm sensors are put at exits of stores, but they can also be put at the exits of factories and warehouses to reduce the chances of theft or loss earlier in what's called the supply chain. Another one is a really simple, straightforward one, locked cabinets and storage containers. And then our third one is a little more complicated, but it's assigning different employees to handle different steps in the inventory processes. So the way it works is uh, the individual in the green shirt, their responsibility is the ordering of the inventory. And then the next person is in charge of the receiving of that inventory. The third person, the orange hoodie here, uh, they are responsible for tracking the inventory uh, from the shipping process to the storage process to transporting it to stores. Then we have a uh, blue sweater here is responsible for storing it. And then pink hoodie is responsible for all things related to transportation, so shipping it and distribution to stores and customers. The reason why assigning different employees to handle different steps in the inventory process is an internal control is because if you have one employee responsible for more than one step, that gives them an opportunity to steal something or to hide or manipulate information. For example, uh, we have our blue shirt is in charge of storing items in a warehouse, let's say. So he has to find space for 100 units. He then has to report where those 100 units are to the orange hoodie so that they can track the location of those items. If the blue sweatshirt was responsible for storing and tracking, he could store 98 of those items and write down or record in the data system that 98 were stored and then steal those two and it would be hard to trace where those two items went. It would be easier for him to steal it, steal them if he controls more than one step in the process. Now uh, that's a lot about inventory and we haven't even come to a conclusion about what it actually is. I know it may seem obvious, but I want to make sure we're all on the same page by establishing a common definition of inventory. And it's this. Inventory is any item purchased by a company for resale to customers or to be used in the manufacture of a product that is then sold to a customer. One of the things that I really like about this definition is that in it you can see the inclusion of both retailers and manufacturers. In the world of manufacturing, there are actually three types of inventory that they can have. Remember, manufacturers are making things to sell. At the end of a workday, their inventory is going to be at different stages of completion. The first type of inventory is raw materials. These are items required to make a finished product. Now let's use the example of a car. The raw materials inventory in a car factory might include things like uh, aluminum and bolts and screws, glass for the windshields. There might be, depending on the car company, leather for the seats. There's going to be glue to put it all together, paint, and so on. The value of this inventory is going to be the cost of the material itself. The second type of inventory is called work in progress. This is the stuff that used to be raw materials and has now been incorporated into the manufacturing process. We can imagine that at the end of a work day, the car is half made. The doors aren't on yet, it hasn't been painted, and the windows aren't in. The raw materials that are now in this uh, let's call it a partially constructed car, would now be considered work in progress inventory. The value of this inventory is the value of the material plus any labor costs, uh, which is the cost of putting the raw material together, and other manufacturing costs like utilities and any depreciation that may have accrued. The final category is finished goods. These are the completed products or goods that are ready for sale. 
So this is the actual car coming off the assembly line, ready to sell to a customer. Those are the three categories or types of inventory for a manufacturer. For retailers, all of their inventory is finished goods. Whether it's clothes, food, or even wrapping paper, it's a finished good, and so that is their inventory. Now, this kind of raises an interesting question. Well, it's interesting for accountants. Uh, if we use our car example, the car counts towards the manufacturer's inventory. But at what point does the value leave the manufacturer's balance sheet and move to the balance sheet of the car dealership? Generally speaking, there are two options. Free on board destination and free on board shipping point. Now, these terms date back to the days when ships were the primary means of uh, shipping. <laughs> it's got to be a better, of transporting goods from place to place. While methods of transportation have changed, the terms have remained in use. Each term indicates at what point in the transportation process ownership or title, and sometimes those two words are used interchangeably, title shifts from one company to the next. In these images, you can see that with free on board destination, the seller slash manufacturer retains ownership until the finished good or inventory reaches the buyer slash retailer. When the inventory arrives at the destination, title switches to the buyer, and that's why the color changes. In this scenario, the manufacturer is responsible for any fees, or charges or expenses uh, related to the transportation. With free onboard shipping, you can see that the colors indicate that the title transfers to the retailer as soon as the inventory leaves the manufacturer. And if I were to ask you who is responsible for the costs associated with shipping, you would say, I hope you said the retailer. Our last topic is about inventory systems. These systems include decisions such as how often will I count the company's inventory and with what tools and what is the most efficient way to manage ordering and reordering inventory. And there are in essence two choices, the periodic and perpetual inventory systems. The periodic system is a regular but infrequent physical count of the company's inventory. And the physical count is the key idea here. It can take place at the end of a month, at the end of a quarter, or at year end. Doing a physical count, like I've tried to show with this picture, can take a lot of time. And the company needs to pay somebody to do that counting. That can either be employees, or they could even hire an outside company to come in and do it. Either way, there is a cost. In addition to that, in some cases, the company may have to close all or parts of its store or facilities to conduct that physical count. You don't want customers moving among physical counters, taking inventory off shelves, uh, deciding they don't want it later and putting it somewhere else. You want um, the store to be a sort of a fixed environment in which to do the count. In a perpetual inventory system, on the other hand, inventory is counted and updated continuously. This is possible with the use of computerized systems that include technologies like scanners and barcodes. When an item is sold, the scanner at the register scans the barcode and the company's inventory is reduced by the number of items scanned. Even with the perpetual system, companies still conduct a physical count of their inventory, usually at the end of the year. This is done to ensure the accuracy of their systems. Sometimes, actually a lot of time, uh, a lot of times, there will be a discrepancy between how much inventory is physically left and how much the system says is left. That difference is usually caused by theft, I mean inventory shrinkage. Perpetual systems can be used to determine inventory shrinkage. Periodic systems cannot. And that takes us to the advantages and disadvantages of these two systems. I'm not going to read this slide 
to you but um, I'm gonna ask you to pause the video and you can write these down as you like and then I'll continue one of the things I do want to say or point out is that with the periodic system it's hard to know when to reorder inventory the company is relying on a physical count of the inventory in some stores I've seen little cards like this one they are placed on the shelves among the inventory so imagine a dozen boxes of cereal on a shelf at a convenience store or a local corner store this card is placed behind the ninth box when that ninth box is sold, an employee will see this card and know that it's time to reorder more cereal to restock the shelves. Now, other thing I want to talk about is this idea of uh, Himjev versus Lululemon, which uh, Himjev is the nickname of a local coffee shop, and Lululemon is an international corporation. So the decision on whether to use a periodic or a perpetual inventory system will depend in part on the size of the company. A coffee shop probably doesn't need a perpetual inventory, inventory system. And I say probably, they might want one. It's hard to track um, individual slices of cold cuts or cheese or coffee beans or whatever the case may be. So it, may, it might make more sense to use the cheaper periodic inventory system. For a company like Lululemon, maybe they are uh, their international shipping, they have orders and resources coming from all over. It would make sense to have a perpetual inventory system. So the size of your company is also a consideration. And that's it. Now this is us just putting our toes in the water of inventory. I do have a couple of other inventory videos about cost formulas, inventory valuation, and performance ratio, and you can click the links here. If that's all the inventory you can handle at one time, you can find those videos on my channel at another time. Until then, thank you very much. I'll see you next time.